Maybe a fun, fun fact about yourself. We love knowing about uh, about everyone. So we see Greg in there. Good morning, Greg. And Louise, MECC's intern. Cindy Ostrowski, always taking stuff with us. We appreciate that. So. And I like to remind folks that um, with these online platforms, the more peripheral applications that you have open, uh, it can slow the, the slide deck down um, and cause uh, kind of that strangled um, sound freezing and whatnot. So if you could close any peripheral applications like Outlook, take a break from work, <laughs> enjoy us for an hour. <laughs> So we'll be getting underway in just about two minutes. Uh, Michelle Gerard, who was with me today and, and always uh, my sidekick, my mentor, my colleague, all of the above, MECC's fearsome associate director and education coordinator. Um, she'll be co-hosting with me this morning. So big welcome to Michelle. It sure is wonderful to see uh, the same people coming to so many workshops. New, new people becoming known names. Uh, it's great in a very short time. We will be, another, another housekeeping item is that um, our speakers today will each be uh, talking about a particular project and because we have six speakers, we had six projects, we're going to um, ask to save questions to the end, but we'd like you to type them into the chat. And if you want to direct them to a particular speaker, please just mention that too. Like, this is for Barbara, you know, and then ask your question. That'll help us uh, review the chat at the end. So thank you very much. Um, all right, and we're just about a minute from, from uh, kicking off here, and I am just going to give a shout out, if I can just get this slide to advance, I get so many windows open, um, to Stantec. Um, Stantec is, is one of the uh, larger firms out there that works in the environmental arena. Um, Here's a, a number of items that they do, uh, particularly peer reviews. If anyone has a larger project or a complex project looking for a peer review. Um, so they work on notice of intent applications, inland and coastal wetland delineations, runa pools, rare species, wildlife habitat assessments, uh, stormwater management. Um, we've got the contact information here. They have offices in Northampton, Boston, Burlington, and Quincy, um, but Stantec does have offices uh, internationally and throughout the country. So um, they are uh, a, a, a partner of MECCs, a su longtime supporter of us. Uh, so we thank them greatly. Here's an, a number of other services, the re uh, renewable energy sector, solar and wind. Um, I know that they do linear projects, uh, site professionals, resiliency, uh, bank and, and wetland restoration and stabilization, dam removal. So we thank them. And just one last time here, um, please take a look at the slide. And if you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself. And I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Gerard. Thank you so much. Sure. I, uh, I'm thrilled to see so many people here this morning for successful habitat restoration requires follow through, coastal case studies and recommendations. I'm going to uh, introduce our group of speakers, the Massachusetts Bay National Estuary Partnership. Mass Bays is an EPA national estuary program dedicated to protecting, restoring and enhancing the estuarine resources of Ipswich Bay, Massachusetts Bay and Cape Cod Bay, the central staff, and the RSPs engage local, state, and federal, and federal entities to advance the use of scientific information and provide technical support for, for better decision-making. 
And with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Jill Carr, who's Mass Bay's Coastal Data Scientist. Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, our workshop is gonna be a panel style. Uh, I'm Jill Carr from Mass Bays, and I will be facilitating our expert speakers followed by um, a brief Q&A session to follow. As Michelle mentioned, Mass Bays is an EPA national estuary program dedicated to protecting, restoring, and enhancing the estuarine resources of Ips Ipswich Bay, Massachusetts Bay, and Cape Cod Bay. We have three central staff in Boston and five regional coordinators that provide local support in five distinct regions from Salisbury to Provincetown. And those five regions are shown on the map here. Our regional coordinators and today's speakers are Peter Fippen in the Upper North Shore region, Barbara Warren in the Lower North Shore, Tori Hanley in Metro Boston, Sarah Grady in the South Shore, and Joanne Miramoto in the Cape Cod region. These speakers have a unique body of knowledge around habitat restoration projects taken on by municipalities, nonprofits, and others within their regions. They'll present case studies and lessons learned for restoration projects, including Phragmites management, living shorelines, oyster reefs, dam removal, and culvert resizing. Now in the permitting of restoration projects, it's important for both commissioners and project proponents to understand the obstacles to and likelihood of successful habitat restoration. These projects must have appropriate goals, monitoring plans and metrics of success so that their effort results in more than just a checking of the box in permitting. Our goals today are to demonstrate obstacles and indicators of habitat restoration success through regional case studies, highlight best practices and new lessons learned, and make recommendations that commissioners can refer to in future project review. And with that, we will get started with a case study from Peter Fippen. Thanks, Jill, um, and good morning to everyone. Uh, this morning, I'm gonna give a uh, rapid fire tour of our decades long project to rid the Great Marsh of invasive Phragmites Australia, Australis. For those who don't know, the Great Marsh is the largest uh, contiguous salt marsh in New England, uh, approximately 25,000 acres, and it's located in the upper North Shore uh, corner of Massachusetts. Next, Jill. We've been uh, mapping for a while. Uh, we started quite a while ago. And as you can see from this graphic, most of the invasive Phragmites is in the upper third of the Great Marsh. And when I talk about invasive Phragmites that we're looking at, it's primarily Phragmites that's growing in the high marsh, high marsh platform out in the middle of the marsh. We're not talking about um, upland edge that grows all over the place uh, in the Great Marsh and probably most marshes in Massachusetts. But we're only looking at um, Phragmites that's colonized the open high marsh. Um, we've been mapping the, um, the density of the, of the stands, the size of the stands, the robustness, maturity of the stands um, for a number of years and trying to figure out what to do. Next slide. <coughs> Um, we've had a lot of partners along the way. Um, two prongs of, of the study early on were research, um, trying to determine why the Phragmites has colonized the middle of the marsh and um, how to address it, as well as looking at the best ways to try to manage and control it, whether it's mowing, fire, uh, different types of chemical application. Next slide. And we even created a task force, which is chaired by the uh, legislative delegation for the communities in the Great Marsh with dozens of members from federal, state, um, local, and nonprofit, and even private membership that help guide us and direct us in how and where and what to do. We've over the years raised nearly a million dollars in funding from various grants to try to do this work, as well as a lot of in-kind services from the various organizations that we partner with. Next slide. We finally settled on chemical treatment as the best route to uh, try to manage the uh, invasive Phragmites, whether it's by boat, backpack, or marsh master, depending on the uh, size and um, location of the, um, the stands. 
Um, all this work is done under the guidance and in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, as they are one of the biggest landowners in this area. Early on, our work was very sp sporadic geographically because we were following the grants. Um, one year we might get a grant from DCR, so we'd work around the Salisbury Reservation. The next year it might be a NACA grant and we'd do some work on the, the uh, wildlife refuge. The next year it might be um, Newbury giving us some funding. Um, that all ended once we got Sandy grants um, about five or six years ago, which allowed us to cover the entire um, marsh as a whole. Next. <clears throat> so as you can see from this, hopefully um, there are hundreds of stands, hundreds of acres of stands and hundreds of property owners in the marsh. And so we really needed to be effective and efficient in how we were gonna address this. And we went to the local conservation commissions to get blanket permission to be able to treat the entire marsh and in some cases, the entire town. And obviously um, it was important for us to obtain property owner permission for each stand that we were treating. Next slide. And here's, uh, the results of um, what happened after we treated. Um, typically, we would get um, new regrowth the very next season, uh, fairly robust. Um, we have a monitoring program out there. Um, half the stations roughly are looking at presence absence, and that was for the, the various grants. We wanted to make sure that we were actually um, taking care of the Phragmites, and the other half is to see how well the um, the vegetation would come back. For those who don't know, those white vertical lines on the on the photographs are dead Phragmite stems. Next slide. And this is sort of a before and after um, a mapping. The red is before, the yellow is after. Um, I want to, uh, and you can see that there's been quite a bit of reduction. And I want to comment on that lower inset where I was out there. That was mapped a, a couple of years ago. And I was out there about a month ago doing some treatments. And I can attest to the fact that that uh, little area there just south of the Merrimack River is um, probably about 70%, 80% reduced from what you see on that graphic. So we've really um, done quite a, quite a good job. Um, we are down to just backpack treatment. Um, and locations throughout the marsh. There's no big stands left. Next slide. So our lesson, lessons learned are that you need to uh, have at least two or three consecutive years of treatment. And the treatments are done in the fall, late summer, early fall. Um, so the chemicals will translocate into the roots and kill it more effectively. Um, Maintenance level treatments will be required. This is a very tenacious invasive, as everyone knows, and just a fragment or a seed will, will get it to go. And we're getting um, little uh, small few stems here, few stems there. So we need to stay on top of it to make sure they don't enlarge. Um, probably one of the benefits of sea level rise is the salinity, and we're, we're tracking that as well is overtaking the marsh very slowly and will eventually keep that the phragmites from from regrouping at least in the middle of the marsh. Um, native salt marsh conditions uh, reoccur, as I mentioned, very quickly af after the first growing season, but it's probably important to have at least a three-year monitoring program to, to track that. And as I mentioned before, when we're dealing with a, such a large scale restoration, it's important to have uh, conservation commissions buy into a marsh-wide permit so to be most effective. Thank you. Excellent, Peter, thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from um, Barbara Warren with a case study in Salem, Massachusetts. Thank you. So this Salem, Massachusetts is an urban city and you see uh, we have an aerial view of Collins Cove and the orange line along the beach is the project area. Uh, we started with the city of Salem, uh, Salem Sound Coast Watch, the city of Salem, uh, as under grants from the Coastal Zone Management and their Coastal Resiliency Grant for um, 
uh, the desire was to create more green infrastructure, natural approaches to mitigate erosion and flooding problems, looking for alternatives to people building bulk, uh, bulkhead seawalls, revetments, this creating a naturalized edge. So the first thing we did is do a shoreline survey of all municipal properties. That was 2015 to 2016. Uh, this, the city decided on uh, um, Collins Cove. Uh, it took us from 2016 to 2018 to do the design and permitting. Uh, we're ready to build in 2019. And, um, and then I'm gonna talk about the maintenance and um, monitoring that followed that. Next. <clears throat> So this is what the project looked like. Uh, it's all city owned property uh, along a heavily used pedestrian and bike path. Uh, the problems existed of flooding, erosion and poor coastal habitat. You can see the one the picture on the left, number one, that the, the path the asphalt path is being eroded from the wave and the gravel coming up and um, hitting that edge. Uh, this is all filled tidelands. It was filled in the late 1800s by the railroad. And so it's an all gravel fill, but we could see salt marsh grasses, um, sea lavender growing, trying to grow on this gravel. Uh, we have a story map that's uh, at the bottom at the afterwards, I'll put this link in the chat and you'll have it on your PDF. Uh, it just shows um, the whole process. Um, lessons learned, so a lot of good information that we've documented you know, about designing and permitting a living shoreline. Next. So finally, in 2019, we got the opportunity to actually construct this um, a living shoreline, a salt marsh. So the first thing we did was put in um, the core log. It's all biodegradable materials. They are held down by steel cables, which we've, um, as the You'll see we've, we've removed those as needed. Then sand was spread and covered with two layers of blankets that again are made from coconut fibers. They were all staked and twined to be held in place so no wave action would lift them. And then, oh, thank you, Tori. She's putting the uh, links in the, in the chat now. And then the, this, um, the next story uh, map is part two, and this goes over the actual construction uh, of the pro project um, and lessons learned. Tori, I mean, uh, Jill. And so Salem Sound Coast Watch, uh, as a partner with the city and coastal zone management, uh, really wanted to get people involved. So we uh, led the, the uh, activity of planting this um, uh, about three quarters of an acre. With um, the picture on the left, you see the grass plugs, um, you see the volunteers um, digging the, uh, making the plug it, the holes uh, with a digger, just uh, making that round hole uh, and then planting them. The bottom row shows um, in September uh, all along, you can see different, we can see that we had uh, Spartina alternate flora cord grass growing among this rock sill that was placed there prior to this project uh, based on the railroad. And um, there's actually a sewer, the PB main sewer line goes under this project as well. Uh, and on the, the, pat, the one on the left, you, number uh, six, you can see that it's a little darker and that's where the last tide came up. Next. So the lesson learned is that the living shorelines are dynamic and they require mo monitoring and maintenance. You, and this is probably true with anything that um, any wetland project that's being uh, built or restored. Um, so we had, um, in October 19th, you know, we only five months later, we had three nor'easters and a 90 mile an hour bomb cyclone that tossed boats onto the shore. So sections of the core logs, you can see that in the upper picture, were thrown up onto, um, onto the marsh. However, even though we had crashing waves during the winter and those storms, the uh, project um, uh, was successful, as you will see. Next. So there's a picture on the left of what our fringing salt marsh looks like now. And the benefits of this is that it stabilizes the shoreline, resists um, erosion, it reduces the wave action. Just 15 feet of marsh can reduce the wave action by 30 to 50%. It protects the surrounding intertidal. Um, this is uh, environment, this is the mudflat. Uh, improves water quality, 
and it creates a habitat. So we always knew that shoreshoe crabs use the cove, but we never knew how many. And the first summer, we just one day when we walked out there in July, we found 42 crab molts ranging from one inch to four inches in size. We have also seen many birds using it. And this is a picture, not a very good one, but it is a picture of a migrating purple sandpiper. Next. So take home. Um, you Salem Sun Coast Watch monitors the marsh regularly with our volunteers. Uh, we alert if there's anything, any issue. We do cleanups and we document the changes. We have done two more plantings and we will continue to do plantings, very small plantings compared to the initial 15,000, but we will continue to do that as needed. Um, storm damage, you really need to have a maintenance fund in place for a minimum of three years and uh, probably five years would be better. Construction materials uh, are deliberately biogradable, so they'll fall apart. At some point, you have to let the marsh take its own. One thing I would say, which I've seen with other uh, shoreline projects, is you never allow a plastic material to be used. It will not. It will not. It will still be there. Um, crossing marine debris, and then monitoring is so important, and it should be funded. Um, and um, team up with a qualified environmental nonprofit. It has done well here. Some nice things would have been to have done an elevation and wave analysis before we got started. Of course, all these things take more time and more money. And the next plus, last slide. So public engagement and education is so important. Communication, uh, always involve the public, interested stakeholders, and find your local groups, neighborhood association, friends groups, nonprofit schools, and signage. Just uh, this is this op, this marsh has been such an opportunity. So many people walk there who don't even know what a salt marsh is. So use that as an opportunity to educate people about the importance of wetlands. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barbara. I love hearing about this project every time. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear a case study from Corey Hanley and. Um, uh, she's in Boston Harbor. She's our Boston Harbor Metro uh, Regional Coordinator, but she'll be presenting work in Rhode Island. Tori? Thanks very much, Jill. I'm excited to be here to um, share the results of the a couple of uh, oyster restoration projects uh, down in Rhode Island, where we've had to the chance to do a couple of different approaches and also do some longer term monitoring to hopefully inform these efforts in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, and kind of echoing what Barbara has just said, um, these, this, these projects would not have been possible without um, collaborative efforts between folks at the Northeastern University Marine Science Center, the Nature Conservancy, and Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Next slide. So we're focusing on two coastal ponds in southern Rhode Island, um, Ninigrit Pond and Quanchantog Pond. Next slide. And in both cases, um, site selection was done as it traditionally is with oyster reef restoration using habitat suitability indices. And then this was followed by on the ground site assessment to choose regions within these ponds that would be most conducive to successful restoration. And reef construction included um, depositing culch, which includes surf clam shell and oyster shell. The Ninigrit restoration was started in 2015 and for these reefs, we were comparing two different approaches. One included uh, seeding the reefs with spat on shell, and the other approach included um, unseeded reefs that only had shell only. And the question that we were wanting to ask here that I think is very much relevant in Massachusetts as well, is whether the addition of juvenile oysters is necessary for restoration success, particularly in these regions where we see very few remnant natural populations. The restoration in Quanchantog started in 2017. In this case, all of our reefs were seeded with spat on shell, but the thing that we wanted to compare here were different oyster lines. So we used a local hatchery line, but then we also went out to remnant local populations and collected broodstock that were then manually spawned in the hatchery that could be used um, to also establish spat on shell and do restorations. And the goal of this project was to answer the question of how does oyster line affect restoration success? So two factors that we think we wanna consider um, as we think about restoration design. Next slide. 
And so, as I mentioned, we, um, we're lucky to have longer term monitoring data. So for Ninigrit, we have from 2015 to 2019 and Quanchintog we have from 2017 to 2020. And I was actually out on these reefs on Monday. Um, so we're still continuing these efforts. So in terms of monitoring the reefs um, in the spring and fall of each year, we were monitoring the area of these reefs as well as different metrics of growth and survival and recruitment of the oysters themselves. Interestingly, for this project, we also monitored parasite prevalence of five micro and macro parasites in the fall of each year. And then we also monitored typical environmental conditions, temperature and salinity monthly from May to October. Next slide. And so um, what you see here are sort of pictorial representations of what people typically propose to monitor in oyster restoration efforts. And the emphasis here is really on the growth of the oysters as well as the survival of the oysters. But what I wanna point out, um, next animation, is that what we really need to think about in these restoration efforts is also recruitment. And so if we're not monitoring recruitment, then we're unlikely to know whether these restorations are likely to become self-sustaining. And interestingly, at these uh, coastal pond sites, despite the fact that there are natural remnant reefs, we still saw little to no recruitment at these sites, so less than one individual per meter squared. And so what this suggests to us from the Ninigrit project is that restoration in this region and arguably in Massachusetts should really include seeding efforts and possibly reseeding efforts um, to increase the chances of these reefs um, establishing and self-sustaining. Next slide. In addition, what we found from the Quanchintog study is that source really matters. So these were reefs that were immediately adjacent to each other. And the only thing that was different was the line that was used to establish the reefs. And we saw huge differences in performance among these oyster lines that were in the same environment. And so this really suggests that when we're reviewing these proposals for restorations to really consider what lines are being used. And I also wanna to toss out the idea that we also wanna think about the value of potentially using multiple lines in these restorations to increase the likelihood of finding oysters that can thrive in these different environments. Next slide. And then I also wanna emphasize that in this project, we were lucky to have the chance to really think about um, parasite interactions. And what we found is that there was not surprisingly a lag effect of parasite interactions where we saw parasite communities really take off um, two to five years after the restoration was started. And this could really impact the long-term restoration success of these projects. And like Barbara and Peter have already said, this emphasizes the importance of monitoring for three to five years. And I also wanna add that we don't need to think just about parasites. Um, so for these reefs, we're also thinking about fish communities. And so just the value of monitoring species that are interacting with our focal restoration species in these projects is something that really is worth considering on um, both economically and ecologically. And then lastly, I'll share um, a couple other considerations that we didn't address in detail in these projects, but we think are important to consider. So we know that these oyster reefs are not being restored in a bubble, that we have um, other systems like salt marshes and seagrass beds adjacent. And so there's a lot of value in considering um, habitat context and setting and whether or not these oyster reefs are likely to succeed and also whether or not they're functionally redundant with other habitats is something to consider as we review proposals. And then as I mentioned earlier, um, and Barbara I think touched on this as well, the potential value of repeated efforts. So in the case of oyster reefs, this is a reseeding approach. So often we see restorations that sort of propose a one and done, um, but in the case of these oyster reefs where we don't have natural remnant populations that may contribute to recruitment, reseeding may be critical to long-term success. And then echoing all of my colleagues today, we know that there's a disconnect between the need for longer term monitoring and funding that may reveal some of these key species interactions um, like parasites and fish communities in the case of oyster reefs. And so thinking about projects that may also propose to revisit restorations from a couple of years ago and to see how those um, trends are going. And then lastly, as I, I'll end as I started by emphasizing that collaboration is key. Um, so these larger scale restoration efforts um, and longer term monitoring efforts would not have been possible without um, our suite of partners. Thank you.
Great, sorry, thank you. That was excellent. Next, we're gonna hear um, about the Third Herring Brook Restoration Project from Sarah Grady. Sarah, do we have you? I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the Third Herring Brook Restoration Project which is a series of three dam removals on the Third Herring Brook, which is a tributary to the North River. Um, it forms the border between two towns, Hanover and Norwell. And um, we were able to remove um, the three dams that were closest to the North River. Uh, Jacob's Pond Dam is going to be remaining in place for multiple specific reasons to that site. Um, it's owned by the town and we'll be putting a fish ladder on that dam. So, next slide. So, uh, these three dams were removed in 2014, 2017, and uh, just this past fall. Um, the Tack Factory Dam, which is the one in the middle, um, was actually the first one from the river. It's a mile from the North River. The next one was 2014, the Mill Pond Dam on the left, 3.4 miles from the river. And then um, Peterson Pond uh, was just this past fall and it's 3.7 miles from uh, the North River. Um, and each of the dam removals costs between uh, $380,000 and $450,000. One of the most important parts of uh, these dam removal projects was the monitoring. At a lot of these sites, we were already doing pre-restoration monitoring, but post-restoration monitoring was also crucial to determine how well uh, the former pond was converting into a healthy wetland, and also to ensure that we had fish passage. The Third Herring Brook has multiple cold water tributaries that were home to Eastern brook trout. So the various kinds of monitoring that we conducted were volunteer river herring counts. Um, so we have one of our young counters here um, on the left. Um, we did electrofishing for Eastern brook trout with uh, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. And we also tagged Eastern brook trout to detect them in different places in the tributary. And then finally, we did wetland vegetation monitoring um, at all three sites. So um, this year is just the first year for Peterson Pond, but um, at Mill Pond, we actually ended up doing about five years of monitoring. And those of you with a keen eye may notice purple loosestrife in the background mm -hmm. of the top photo, um, which is generally the main invasive species that we are concerned with when we're doing our monitoring. Next. So at Mill Pond, uh, we actually had a specific purple loosestrife monitoring project. So um, we had quite a lot of purple loosestrife, about 60% of the wetland was covered with purple loosestrife um, because the dam had breached prior to a few years prior to our removal. So that was, that was able to establish itself. Um, the dam was removed in late 2014. And then when we went out uh, in 2015, it had um, kind of come back uh, some. And it was important at that point to continue to monitor for multiple additional years to determine that this wasn't um, an upward trend. And I forgot to note that the reason that there was such a huge drop between 2013 and 2014 is that we initiated a pre-restoration purple loosestrife control program um, using Galerocella beetles, which specifically eat and attack purple loosestrife. So most orders of conditions call for monitoring of revegetation and invasives, um, but it's usually kind of thrown in to the end of the local orders of condition and there's not really a provision for long-term monitoring, which in this case is about three to five years, ideally. Often our project partners, particularly the dam owners, want to close out the orders of conditions and get their certificates of compliance 
before this monitoring has been complete. They just want it off the books, they want to be done. Um, so it's very important to ensure that that is part of the permitting. And you may not actually be having uh, reinvasion or, or a problem, but there's natural variation, of course, this is nature, this is ecology. And we want to be able to determine whether increases in certain kinds of vegetation might be just a function of uh, the weather that year or whether it's actually a true trend. So in this case, the dam was removed in 2014. Uh, we were able to submit a final report on that vegetation monitoring in 2017 after three years of post-removal monitoring and feel pretty confident that we weren't going to see a resurgence of purple loose strife. Next slide. The other interesting success story from the Ferdheim Brook restoration was um, sort of this ideal chain of events from restoration through protection of the resource. So um, in the case of the TAC factory uh, dam removal, um, removing that dam opened up the connections between the cold water tributaries and we started to see Eastern brook trout come into the main stem. That meant that the thir entire third Heim brook could then be classified as a cold water fisheries resource, um, which is a critical area. It requires stricter stormwater standards. And that applies to both um, redevelopment and new development. Right behind the Peterson Pond Dam, or actually the Peterson Pond Dam is behind uh, the former Hanover Mall. And they uh, are completely redoing the mall. They're building a housing complex. And our dam removal uh, down at Tack Factory influenced the stormwater permitting for the mall, which is right near Peterson Pond. So um, we were able to provide some advocacy based on uh, the results of the dam removal monitoring. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for tying in the, um, the regulatory piece of that. Um, next, we're gonna hear from our last presenter this morning. It is um, Joanne Miramoto from um, Cape Cod region, presenting on the Stony Brook Salt Marsh and Fish, pa Fish Passage Restoration Project. Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, the Stony Brook Salt Marsh and Fish Passage Restoration Project is located in Brewster on the north side of Cape Cod. The watershed contained 20 acres of tidally restricted salt marsh and a popular herring run that provides fish passage to 386 acres of spawning habitat. Next, please. Uh, so these were the problems to address. Uh, the salt marsh was degraded by insufficient tidal flow due to an undersized four foot wide culvert under a state highway. Migratory fish passage for herring was restricted due to the narrow size of the covert opening. Uh, the covert was failing and shedding debris. Phragmite, Phragmites was growing in and around the salt marsh. Um, woody vegetation was encroaching on the margins. A uh, tidal study show, also showed unequal tidal depths on both sides of the covert, indicating insufficient tidal flow to the restricted side. Next, please. So these were the restoration goals, partners and funding. Um, the goals were to restore 20 acres of degraded salt marsh by enlarging the culvert to restore tidal flow. Uh, also to improve fish passage to 386 acres of spawning habitat and 3000 feet of stream habitat, again, by enlarging the culvert and to reduce Phragmites and woody vegetation encroaching on the salt marsh by restoring tidal flow. Uh, the partners were NOAA, uh, Tana Brewster, uh, Division of Ecological Restoration, APCC, and Mass Bays. These were, um, were the members of the project team, and NOAA was the lead on the project team. And other partners, uh, which are critically important, are uh, listed. Uh, the funding was primarily from NOAA through the Gulf of Maine Council and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act with a considerable in-kind match from project partners. The total cost of the project, uh, not counting match, was 1.6 million. Next, oh, uh, let's see, I, oh, 
if you could go back. Yes, I wanted to show that the um, pre-restoration modeling study uh, showed that uh, additional marsh inundation would occur after tidal restoration as shown by the yellow areas. Next, please. So these photos show the culvert before and after restoration. Before restoration, it was a four foot undersized culvert that's kind of visible in the middle of the upper left photo. Uh, the 18 foot box culvert on the right shows uh, final conditions at full stream width. Uh, the restoration work to replace the four foot culvert with the 18 foot box culvert was completed in the fall of 2010. Next, please. Following uh, restoration, vegetation changes happened quickly. Within a year, woody vegetation began dying and Spartina started to replace Phragmites. Within three years, the relative abundance of salt marsh species increased from 83% to 95%. Next, please. After restoration in 2010, the average salinity and tidal water depths on the restored side increased, which is good. Next, please. After restoration, uh, Phragmites decreased and shifted to the margins and upstream. Salt reed grass or Spartina sinusoides, which is a state listed species, also expanded to the margins. Next, please. Uh, before restoration, estimated herring run sizes were generally in the tens of thousands, as shown by this plot. After restoration and beginning in 2013, herring run sizes increased dramatically by an order of magnitude to the hundreds of thousands. Larger run sizes have persisted since then, with the exception of 2017. Next, please. Uh, we were uh, really fortunate to have a large number of great partners. Um, they include um, public and private sector partners, landowners, local, uh, regional, uh, state and federal partners, um, and et cetera. And these were partners were absolutely essential for our success. Next, please. So these were some of our challenges, which we uh, overcame. Uh, it involved a state highway. Um, we needed uh, chamber of commerce support because there were businesses located along this uh, highway. We had some unanticipated permitting, ne permitting needs, which we uh, addressed. And the lessons learned, um, these are listed. Um, technical planning studies are essential. Both pre and post restoration monitoring is also essential. We found that short term post restoration monitoring by short term, I mean, three years um, may show good may show good results and did in this case. We really recommend um, longer term post restoration monitoring five to 10 years for showing sustained restoration. Um, an example here was the herring run sizes. Uh, but we also saw improvements in the salt marsh after that period of time. Uh, monitoring of both physical and biological parameters provides complementary information. Uh, we really need a rapid method of monitoring salt marsh vegetation. And last of all, uh, partners are essential. And thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Joanne. So with that, um, I'll summarize uh, some of the information you've heard today. Your heads must be spinning um, after five incredible lightning speed talks. Um, they have These speakers have a wealth of knowledge and you should feel free to contact them directly if, um, if any of these presentations really resonated for you. Um, but I'd like to, to synthesize several of the overarching recommendations that you've heard today. In terms of monitoring scope and duration, we feel that restoration projects should collect quality baseline data against which the post-restoration monitoring will be compared. Projects should couple physical and biological monitoring together, especially in coastal environments. It'll give better context in evaluating success and resiliency to climate change. And importantly, some types of restoration may need a much longer duration of monitoring than is typical. 
For example, a longer duration is needed to detect continued use of a restored fish passageway or to ensure restored native plants are seeding adequately. Three years should be the bare minimum and up to 10 years uh, should be used depending on the project type. But of course, that level of monitoring requires a great deal of commitment um, as well as funding, which leads to the need for capacity and follow through. Project proponents should convene stakeholders early in project design to identify partners. As we've seen in all five talks today, having the right partners can increase stewardship of the restored habitat and also increase monitoring and maintenance manpower. Ultimately, some broader commission level changes may be appropriate, such as lengthening the order of conditions duration, participating in blanket approvals for larger projects that cover uh, that cross municipal boundaries, requiring maintenance plans and contingency funds for maintenance, and if not already doing so, reviewing monitoring data and making the certificate of compliance tied to restoration success. And with that, we will open the last few minutes to take questions um, and review the, the, uh, the chat box. And we thank you so much for your time this morning. So I'm not sure if, um, if Michelle, oh, Michelle, you're muted. I, I was just the most eloquent I've ever been to. <laughs> of course. The, um, the summary piece really drives home uh, the importance of uh, conservation commissioners and agents working with applicants to tie longer monitoring to the order of conditions. That's really a big piece of it. And I'm also amazed by how quickly, um, just how quickly nature rebounds when tidal flows are, are restored. Just remarkable. And now I'll uh, let us get to the questions. Some of the questions are, are, are have been responded to. Um, I'll start by asking questions. And if we find that, they're that they've been answered, just tell me to go, tell me to pass along. Um, let's see. We've already talked about a marsh master. Did the town conservation commissions, here's one for Peter. Oh, this was me. Issue, I think you already answered this, issue the same order of conditions in each of the towns. And I think you already answered that, that they did. Um, yes, we got an RDA in each of the towns. An RDA, great. So you, so there was a lot of cooperation amongst the towns. That was yes. really important. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. And here's Guffey, was the uh, dead Phragmites material mulched? cut down after treatment or did it remain on the site? Most of it remained on the site. Um, we, we got Northeast Mass mosquito control during the winter time to go out and cut down the standing dead material. Um, but that was only when they could do it and when the conditions allowed. Um, but yeah, most of it was left there in standing form. Um, generally the ice will take care of it after a year or two years or three years. Okay, and can you uh, can you say a little bit more about what a marsh master does uh, in the in this application? Sure, the marsh master it sort of looks like a small snow cat. It's a track low ground pressure vehicle that is made of aluminum and can actually float, so it can cross um, the wider channels as well as all the creeks and such. And it's really just for access. Um, out into the marsh where it's extremely difficult to get to even by boat. Um, it carries a tank and a sprayer on it. And it's generally only used for the largest stands, the, the quarter acre, half acre size, high density Phragmites because it, it's um, very efficient at, at um, targeting those locations. And that's something that the backpack sprayers and even the boat sprayer can't really do is these large scale stands. So it's for getting the large stands out in the middle of the marsh. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and for Tori, are the oysters placed in subtidal areas or intertidal? Curious how oysters do in the winter if they're, if they're exposed during part of the tide. Yeah, thanks for asking this. I responded in the chat, but they were, these were all subtidal reefs. Um, so they, they weren't exposed. Um, so I do think that would change the outcomes, but that wasn't the case um, for these restorations. 
And another uh, uh, question. Michelle, Michelle, yeah. I'd just like to add, I was on a call just uh, at the beginning of this week, another um, researcher in New York, in Rhode Island, and they said that their oyster reefs were uh, intertidal and that they were um, could be killed off from heat waves and um, really cold water. Oh, so that is something that I heard just this week. Wow. Okay. Uh, here's a question. How were you able to control recruiting? Was the hatchery line better? And you may have answered this too. I did, but I can, I can give it. So in terms of recruiting, um, we deployed recruitment tiles, which were simply ceramic tiles like you'd use in your kitchen on cement pavers. And so that allowed us to get um, an exact estimate of recruit numbers. And after the first year, we could also differentiate any new recruits from the initial oysters based on size differences. Um, and in terms of which line is best, the answer is it depends on what you're looking at. So for example, the hatchery line had really fast growth rates, which is not surprising because that's often what hatchery lines are selected for. Um, but the hatchery line had higher um, parasite prevalence than um, a lot of the local lines that um, had probably been experiencing many of these parasites. So basically the takeaway was there was no one best line, um, which is why I suggest that perhaps having multiple lines could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, Tori again, Mass Oyster Project wants to seed Essex Bay with oysters that they have grown. Can you help advise on how to identify micro environments to seed which will provide the most success? Yeah, that um, was I my did. question, um, and maybe Tori and I can talk about that oh. offline unless she feels it's uh, valuable for the entire group. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to follow up with you, Peter. And I, I didn't talk about this in my talk because there wasn't time, um, but within these coastal ponds, we actually did the restorations in different regions of the pond, um, and we saw huge differences in the success of the restoration, even at that micro scale. Um, so yeah, Peter, I'd be happy to chat about that. Right, okay. Can you give a little more detail about the beetle used to control purple loosestrife? Uh, does the insect population last multiple years? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I answered this in the chat, but okay. I'd love to just reiterate that um, it's called Galerosella and um, it's specific to purple loosestrife and it does survive uh, from year to year. So once the population is established, it will continue to eat the purple loosestrife and will also migrate to other purple loosestrife. So we actually saw that happen because uh, we released at Mill Pond and then um, it started controlling at um, Peterson Pond, which is about a third of a mile away. Okay. I, I think I have captured the questions because many of them have been answered in the chat. Um, are there any new questions? Julie has one. So in multiple municipal scale projects, does each town only review the work done within the town's jurisdiction and issue an order of conditions for just that area? I'm guessing that's for me. Yeah. And yes, that's yeah. the case. We went to each town um, we're requesting an RDA, and, but they all know what we're doing and what the other town has done and how we've done it. So even though their jurisdiction is limited, their knowledge is not. I think it's, I just think it's terrific that you were coordinated at the effort, that the effort was coordinated to have, to have each commission issue the same permit. Um, it'd be nice to see that happen uh, more frequently, you know, when, when you have massive re restoration projects like this. Yeah, that's key, definitely key. Great. And any other questions? And if I missed something, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you. Because we have a few more minutes. So I think, I think um, when people receive the PDF of this presentation, uh, it's going to be very likely that you'll have additional questions or ideas that you'd like to discuss with people. And um, as you mentioned, Jill, people are free to, to contact. We have the contact information for each of the speak, each of your uh, regional coordinators and people should feel free to reach out to them. 
Yeah, I think I, I just in general, I'd like to say that if you live in the Mass Bays region, um, hopefully uh, you already know your okay. regional coordinator. But um, if you don't, please, uh, you know, let us know. We're all a lot, mostly jacks of all trades. <laughs> so um, if it relates to that coastal area, we probably have some sort of insight and can help you. That's great. That's right, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and before anybody leaves, I just wanna make sure that we thank um, Michelle and, um, and MACC for having us today. We're, we're so happy to have this platform to share our message and, and outreach to you all. And um, to my awesome Mass Bay's colleagues, thank you so much for your, your level of knowledge um, in your communities and your willingness to come share it with the group. So thank you so much. Well, thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you. And I think if um, if questions are done, we can let people go and carry on with the, getting ready for the next workshop or getting back to work. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate thank your you. sharing. Thank you.